her ambition and drive to treat us as female athletes and not small men was probably my biggest thing that she drove year on year, whether that's bringing in a menstrual doctor, a sleep doctor, like really delving into okay. like sports science and how do we how do we make it different? It's not just about everyone doing S and C the same way. We're all different athletes, different women. We're all different sizes and playing different yeah. positions and need different strengths and have different weaknesses. Hello and welcome to We Are Chelsea, the official podcast of Chelsea Women, brought to you in association with Skoda, the official car partner of Chelsea Women and proud supporters of women's sport. I'm Kaz Demores, and today I'm joined by former Chelsea goalkeeper and club legend Carly Telford. Carly had not one, but two stellar spells in blue and now works in the women's commercial department at the club as well. Welcome to We Are Chelsea. How are you and where are you today? I'm really good. I don't know if you can see me, but if you can, I look like I'm about to hold a press conference. Um, if you can't see me, I'm currently in the press room um, up in the first team men's building. Um, but yeah, I am in a very quiet building because the guys play tonight, so it's nice and quiet up here. <laughs> I love it. I love it loads. Um, I need to ask you about your new role at the club, but I will come to that a little bit later on. I feel like there's so much to talk to you because I want to talk to you about your life in blue. You arrived at the club in 2011 from Leeds. Do you remember the day that you were first approached about playing for Chelsea? I do, yeah. Um, and it's it probably was even before Leeds um, because it was Matt Beard that approached me. So he was the Chelsea manager at the time. Um, and I remember before Leeds, uh, Charlton actually approached okay. me. So... At the time, it was Matt Beard was assistant manager there. And then Charlton unfortunately fell through um, because their men's team got relegated. So they pulled all the funding away from their women's team. So then I went and played for Leeds. Okay. But we always maintained contact, me and Beardy. Um, so when Leeds, the story with Leeds is that everyone at that time was playing in the Premier League, it was called. And the WSL was a brand new franchise that everyone had to apply to get in to. Um, we were actually a really good team, uh, Leeds. We'd um, won our first trophy. We had lots of internationals playing for us, very promising uh, team. And unfortunately, uh, Carnegie, who our sponsors at the time, pulled the uh, plug and the funding. So Leeds then never then didn't exist anymore. So Matt Beard got on the phone to me and said, how do you fancy coming to play for Chelsea, who will be in the new WSL? Um, and when a club like Chelsea comes knocking on your door, um, it's very hard to say no. Um, unfortunately, Chelsea weren't in the position that they are in currently, which is mm -hmm. obviously not top of the league, but second. Um, and in lots of trophies, they were very much a brand new team um, that was looking to kind of start challenging. But um, yeah, I was kind of young and wanted to play at the highest level. Um, I was playing for England at the time as well. So yeah, I signed for Chelsea um, at its very young infancy for, for Matt Beard. It's brilliant. It's always interesting, I guess, to hear from players who have just signed in 2024 and players who signed when Chelsea was a very different Chelsea. Mm -hmm. like Fran told us that when she signed her contract, it was in a service station. Yeah. She was like, there was not glamorous. I was just in a service station. I can't even remember which one. Where did you sign yours? And I guess, <laughs> how different was it signing for Chelsea back then? Yeah, it was the same. So I met Matt um, in a service station. And um, it was weird because obviously, as you can hear, I am a Geordie. So I lived in the Northeast. I used to travel to Leeds uh, after work. Um, during this time as well, the FA had announced that they were giving us central contracts so we could give up our jobs for the first time and be like professional full-time athletes, which was £16,000. So at the time I was working for T-Mobile on £18,000. I thought, oh, if I can be a full-time footballer and take a two grand pay cut, I'll do it. So I'd kind of given up my job as working in a call centre, which allowed me to move to London. However, uh, Chelsea didn't provide accommodation, which was quite funny. Okay. Um, so I was, uh, yeah, although I'd signed my contract for a minimal amount of money, um, I was very lucky that because Leeds had been disbanded and some of the girls, Steffa won at the time and Ellen White, who played for Leeds, had also signed for Arsenal. And I knew Vic Akers, who was manager of Arsenal at the time, um, because he tried to sign me as a kid when I was 17 for Arsenal, but I was too scared. Uh, so I didn't move to Arsenal when I was younger. Um, he oh my God, me so this could have been a completely yeah, different... Yeah, a very different journey, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, but because he knew me and I didn't have anywhere to live, he allowed me to live with Steph in one of the Arsenal houses. So I actually <laughs> lived in London Colony with Steph um, and with Ellen White and then Jordan Nobbs. 
and the next couple over the the three year three four year period I was at Chelsea um, and then commuted around the M25 and also still worked for T-Mobile during the day <laughs> in oh Hertfordshire. So yeah, I was kind of working part time. I was playing on evening at Chelsea when we only trained twice a week, uh, Tuesday, Thursday nights, and played on Sundays. Um, and lived with the Arsenal girls. So yeah, it was it was quite an intriguing one when we had to play against each other. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, wow. it was uh, yeah, very different. But yeah, it was um, very much similar. It was uh, in a service station. Glamorous. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's so, <laughs> I was going to say, what are the differences between Chelsea back then and Chelsea now? Well, first of all, they probably don't live with Arsenal girls. <laughs> No, they don't. Um, but yeah, it was it was very interesting. But I'm very grateful for Vic for allowing me to do that because it allowed yeah. me to play for Chelsea, or else I don't actually know what I would have done. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was it's a it's actually a really funny story, but very cool. Um, and yeah, I guess it showed where uh, women's football was what ten. Yeah, I think it was Millie Bright who said to us that um, the lunches were a brown paper bag when she started you'd pick up your lunch and now she's like it's completely different what are the key differences from a 2024 Chelsea and a 2011 Chelsea I think it's it's really important for everybody to know the journey of this club and the journey that that Emma Hayes has particularly taken this team on um, and it's not just the trophies we've won for instance this building has been here since I joined this club in 2011 um, but I wasn't allowed in it we weren't allowed in it um we were okay. only allowed in this training facility um, Tuesday, Thursday evenings between eight and 10 o'clock at night. Um, most of the time the groundsman would forget that we were here. Uh, so we'd switch the, the lights off, usually about half nine, but we still usually had a half an hour. So we'd pick the stuff up and leave. We had one uh, training kit each um, and one playing kit each that had to be washed by the manager at the time. Uh, we wow. represented Chelsea, but that was probably about it. We weren't paid or paid a lot. And that was my first experience of what Chelsea was like. Um, and that's, I think that summed us up. We were second, third bottom, didn't win a lot. We got to one cup final, um, which I was captain for, got to penalties, saved two penalties. Unfortunately, we missed three, so we came second. Um, but that was probably the closest we got in terms of success. Um, when Emma came in, so that was my third year at Chelsea, um, that's when everything changed. Um, when we first okay. met, she was super ambitious. It came, has came, had came from like an American professional league. Uh, we finally got some rooms in a building um, down the bottom, which was the development um, and kind of like the, where they have like the international coaching and stuff like that, that was all based in the building at the bottom, which is now the women's first team building. Um, but yeah, we, we had one or two rooms where you could get changed uh, down there before wow. we'd walk up to, to train and again, Tuesday, Thursday nights, but it just snowballed. Um, from there, she started recruiting players from around the world because of who she was. Um, she got more investment year on year. Yeah, her vision when I was first here was that she was going to win the league within three to four years. She was going to make Champions League and they'd win an FA Cup in three to four years. Um, and she went and did that within her first three to four years. And when I tell you she came in with absolutely nothing, but probably a, a bag of balls, some cones and some kit, that is literally what she had. Um, wow. But her ambition to be able to go and turn it into the superpower that it is 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 it's pretty incredible when you, you look at you look at it and you think about it. But it's also good to let people know the journey that we've come on. And when we speak about Arsenal, and I was living with the Arsenal girls, like they were, had everything already. They were full time. Okay. They were they were in all the kit. They were like I was very jealous that I'd have to bring my kit home and wash it. And they had like a kit man, a kit person. They had their meals sorted. They were traveling, they were doing overseas tours to Japan and pre-season tours and stuff, mm. stuff that like we could, we were no, never, never anywhere near. And that's why they are, or were the powerhouse and still are a powerhouse of women's football. But I think it's Emma's coming from Arsenal knew that they had that as well. And she wanted to make sure that Chelsea weren't going to be left behind and that we were going to be competing them in the future. And I think that's what she's been able to do. So um, yeah. very long winded, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been quite the journey. Brilliant. No, we like it. <laughs> um, who were the key players in the dressing room at that time? Oh, back in the day, God, it was um, Claire Rafferty, uh, Sophie Perry, Jilly Flatty, Katie Chapman. Um, some of those girls like prop, like grown up around kind of England uh, under 17s, 19s and 23s. So I knew a few of them from then, Helen Lander, Helen Blazard. There was quite a good few personalities, but everyone was at that stage where like we knew we were all part time, wanted to be full time, didn't know f football was going to take us where we wanted it to. Okay. There was rumours that the WSL was kind of going to be a big thing. But again, it was all a test and learn for everybody. Um, 
Yeah. Man City had gone full time at this point and were kind of leading the way as well. Had recruited really well. Arsenal, obviously Arsenal, um, kind of had recruited very well again. Um, had some good youngsters coming through. Um, but Emma knew that she wanted to us to be up there. And uh, although we had good personalities, did we have right personalities for the dressing room and for the ambition that she wanted to take us on? Um, you can argue no, because a lot of us were released. I was one of them being quite a young, naive um Geordie kid that very much enjoyed living in London and being a part-time footballer. Uh, um, but she knew she needed professionals, uh, well-established footballers that wanted to come in and make a difference and take this team to another level. Um, so her recruitment was was very clever, not only in the personalities that she brought in, but the professionals that she brought in. Um, and as my time went on and I went away and then came back, God, I, I honestly feel so blessed to have shared the dressing room with some of the personalities that I've had. G So Yun, Enio Lucos, um, Kaz Carnies, Millie Bright, Sam Kerr's. Like the, the the list is is quite incredible when I reflect mm-hmm. on it. Not just for their footballing abilities, but even like Crystal Dunn, Drew Spence, Hannah Blunt, like every day coming into work, if you want to class it as work was just a pleasure because there'd always be something going on. There'd always be someone joking, someone in a mood, a bad mood, a good mood, someone taking the mick out of each other, like groups that would get together and and just take the mick out of each other. And there was just always something going on. It was just such a a really nice dynamic to come and work in. But again, just such an ambitious group that just always wanted to win. And that was in training, that was in the gym, in the small-sided games. And then every weekend when we played and every, every kind of week, midweek if we had games it was yeah as personalities go I think because I was here for such a long period of time um and then even recently with with the likes of Erin and, and Millie and Guru and yeah I, the list goes on like everyone has brought yeah. something different to this dressing room in a, in a difference in a different way um whether it's culturally their personality their football their football and prowess like it's hard to 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 pick out favorites because yeah sure yeah it's just yeah I just I have so many memorable moments with so many different people um yeah I feel very very lucky to have I've spent a lot of time with these with these girls well I'm gonna come to your second spell in just a moment and I want to <laughs> but I want to briefly touch on your first spell what are some of the standout moments and how do you look back at Chelsea in that first spell at the club um it's a really good question. I think standout moments is, is the FA Cup final. Um, we weren't very good in the league and we'd gone on a bit of a mad cup run. I remember turning up to Bristol and it was a, a pretty packed and full stadium playing against Birmingham, who at the time were one of the best or the best in the league. They had a lot of amazing players playing for them and they'd done some amazing things and, and we were up there competing with them. It was a, a beautiful day as most days are on FA Cup final day. And we got so close to getting over the line twice, one in full time when we conceded a Kaz Carney free kick, which he took cheekily before the referee blew a whistle. I um, won't talk about that. And then again, we went ahead in extra time and then conceded late on in extra time. And then like save penalties, we unfortunately missed three. And, um, I saved two, but missed three. So it meant that we lost. But I think a team that was, yeah, not doing very well in the league to go on a really good FA Cup run was was really cool. And obviously FA Cup final day was, especially back then more than anything, was the pinnacle of your, your career because it was the game that was on TV, the only one that was on TV. Um, you'd always get a massive crowd. For some reason, it's always a really sunny, warm day. Um, and yeah, it was it was just a, a fantastic moment. Um, other than that, like being given the captain's armband was was incredible. Um, to captain a club like Chelsea is, and I always kind of forget about it. I think it, because it was it felt not really real or quite amateur at the time that it doesn't feel as powerful maybe as it does now. But to be able to have done that and and yeah, probably a long line of amazing people that have represented yeah. this club as captains is is quite special as well but yeah um i'd say that i'm just grateful for that small kind of moment that i enjoyed but also give me a massive reflection as to who i wanted to be as a person and a footballer because i was quite like say young immature i loved representing this club but did i truly believe in who my capabilities as a footballer and who i was as a person probably not um but this that spell taught me so much um and made me grow up as such as well. So, uh, yeah, my first three years was was fun. It was hard work, a lot of travel. Um, but yeah, it gave me perspective, I guess, on who I wanted to actually really be as a human and as a footballer. So um, I'm grateful for it. It was difficult, but uh, yeah, it turned out all right in the end, I guess. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely did. So I want to come to your second spell because being released must have at the time had a mixed bag of emotions. Um, and then you came back for your second spell in 2017. How much had the club changed in that time? And I guess, what was it like rejoining and what made you want to rejoin? Um, so the, the story of me being released is actually quite a funny one. Um, so like I said to you, I, I was captain at the time. I'd come back and Emma had told me all her plans people that she was mm -hmm. going to release, people that she was going to bring in. So I was thinking, this is, I'm here for this. Like, finally, we're going on this this journey. And then I got a, it's quite quiet over pre-season. Um, and then I get a call. Uh, Hi, Carly. I'm here with Paul and Stuart. So Paul's the general manager. Stuart is the goalkeeper coach. Just want to let you know that uh, we won't be renewing your contract. And I was like, right then. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I do now? Um, didn't see it coming at all. Uh, oh, wow. So okay. it was quite a shock and a mixed bag because obviously the first thing you feel is like quite angry. Um, yeah. Quite probably bitter in the fact that like I wasn't in her plans. But this this was the, the bit that like you say, it probably um, turned me into the person that I needed to be. Um, so I went and signed for, I got reunited with the Leeds manager who was then the Notts County manager. Like, so you, you franchised your way into the league at the time. So Notts County, as much as people don't know about much about them and they, their men's team play in the lower leagues, uh, they were quite ambitious in their what they wanted to do with their women's team. So they employed Rick Passmore, who was my ex-Leeds manager. He um, got me to sign for Notts County and I spent the next four years determined to make sure that I played my best against Emma Hayes <laughs> and Chelsea, um, which I did. I did not bad at, but I never, I never spoke badly about Emma. I never, I always shook her hand at the end of games. I watched her build what she said she was going to recruit some okay. amazing players, some amazing talent. Um, watched them rock up to Notts County in lovely buses with kit men, physios, doctors, um, some of the best players in the world that she'd signed. Um, but made sure, like you say, I, I did my best to play well against them. Um, Obviously got reunited in the first FA Cup final at Wembley uh, when we played against um, Chelsea, lost 1-0 to a G, so a young goal. And then, um, yeah, you, I guess you could call it fate maybe, but um, like you say, you have to franchise into the league. And when Notts County got sold to a new owner, he decided they didn't want a women's team. So we were about a week out from starting the season. Um, and this is when it flipped from, so again, to some of the Chelsea fans who are maybe new to the women's team, the women's league actually used to play through the summer. So we used to play because we didn't, the FA kind of wanted to find a way is, are we competing against men's football and women's football? So we used to play February to, to November and then decided to switch it back to the to mirror, to mirror the men's uh, season. And uh, so during that time when they switched it back, we had a spring series, it was called. So obviously mm -hmm. we'd have a year off while they switched it back. And this mini season ran, uh, I think it was like March to, to June, something like that. And a week before we started that mini spring series, uh, we basically all got told we were made redundant at Notts County because the women's team was never going to exist anymore, uh, which was great. So that was, <laughs> that was interesting. Um, and then three days later, I get a call. Um, and it's Stuart, the goalkeeping coach. I mean, she would always stayed friends um, because he, yeah, we just always stayed in contact through England and stuff like that. He just always kind of checked in on me. He says, right then, Carl, he's like, um, what's happening? Uh, what are you doing for the next three months? Have you had any approaches? And I was like, no, man, I'm pretty much got to work for the next few, few months, hoping someone's going to come in. He's like, and at the time, uh, Becky Spencer and Hedvig Lindahl were the goalkeepers and Fran Kitchen was a young goalkeeper and Becky and Hedvig were injured. And they're about okay. to start their season. So they're like, look, we haven't got a goalkeeper. Would you want to come play for Chelsea for the spring series for like a couple of months? And I thought, I'm not going to jump at it because I don't want to sound desperate. So I'm mm. just going oh, to let me think about it. Put the phone down. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the best thing ever. <laughs> so I let it sit for like half an hour. And then I was like, nah, like I picked the phone. I said to you, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm free. Like uh, when you want me to sign, he's like, can you come down to train? And like literally tomorrow. So I was wow. like, Pfft. I mean, I guess so. Yeah. Like literally packed my, I just moved into a house in Nottingham, whatever. And then all of a sudden I was like, just got a dog. Cause again, I thought that was going to be my, I was just going to be at Notts County for the kind of the rest of my career. And it all changed very fast. So I literally packed my bags, got the dog looked after and, and drove down to London into, uh, Cobham where I was, name was on a list, sent down to the first team building, which we had a building, which was incredible, not a room. Uh, gets there. Uh, Winnie the kit man greets me. We have a kit man. Um, <laughs> I get in there. We've got a locker room, a gym. We're getting meals. Uh, I was just like, my mind was was blown. Like 
Um, obviously Emma Paul Stewart all greeted me like introduced me to everyone I'm now sat in a room with some of the best players in the world some of the girls that I'd also left three or four years ago um, obviously like some of the youngsters that weren't youngsters anymore yeah. Um, but yeah it was just um, it was my mind was was blown by it anyway we went on to win the spring series and I got offered a two year contract and I guess you can see the rest is history but um, yeah it was it was a it was a whirlwind um, but I guess, like you say, call it fate, call it whatever, but I end up being, yeah, back reunited with Emma, um, growing up a lot and, yeah, showing what I could I could really do. I guess it also is a testament to the maturity that you handled a very business-like decision because Emma has to make some decisions and at that time when she released you, I'm sure it wasn't personal, it was just she had this game plan and you could have been really bitter and maybe burnt your bridges, but it was also your mentality to go, okay, I'm going to always shake your hand and I'm going to be <laughs> brilliant every time I play against <laughs> you. Great that is there. a maturity, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's, um, look, I'd like to think out of anything, um, I've always tried to be a good person. I think that out of anything in life, if you can treat people well, um, shake their hand, uh, smile, like be polite. I think that's something my mum always instilled in me is to, is to be a good human, basically. I think that in any walk of life, any business you walk into, whether that's football, into a, a football dressing room, into a business, into an office, like is being, is being a good person. And there are going to be decisions that are sometimes out of your control and not always what you want or see mm. coming. Um, but I don't think that should turn you into someone that you aren't. Um, and yeah, I just, I didn't think our pass would cross again other than playing against each other. Um, but they did. And I think Emma always said to me, she was like, I knew I'd bring you back one day. And that's, wow. that's what she always said to me. And whether that's true or not, <laughs> or, or like, but I think she always knew that if I'd go away and probably work hard on the things she wanted me to, that we'd, we'd be kind of reunited along the way somehow. So yeah, I'm, I'm very blessed to have that. And it, it, whether it's a maturity, whether it's a just trying to be a, a good a good human and a good person every day is it's probably a bit maybe a bit of both. Um, but I truly yeah. believe that being able to do that has probably allowed me to to sit, to one go back to playing football, but maybe two lead on to maybe the job role that I do now as well. So um, yeah, it's and also I like I always say it's a little bit of luck, right place, right time. <laughs> Wow. A fit look. Yeah, okay. A little bit of a sprinkling <laughs> of luck, but it's very good. Millie, I think, had a similar thing where she said Chelsea came knocking and she said no. And I was like, what? They only come knocking once. And she was like, I know, but they came knocking twice for me, so I was lucky. I was like, <laughs> exactly. So sometimes exactly. there is a bit of luck. But yeah, let's and sometimes they this. know like having a bit of like like you say, is it do you say no to Chelsea? Is it just like sometimes it's not you're not ready and it's not meant to happen yet either. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think a pair of us have, have probably had some decisions go our way and made the right decisions along the way, which is, has led to where we are now. But it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Definitely. It's funny. This podcast is brought to you by Skoda, the official car partner of Chelsea Women, who are committed to helping to grow women's sport. Whether you're watching the game with your friends or family, playing on a Sunday morning or cheering on from the sidelines, Rain or shine, Skoda are there to take you on your next adventure. So, what are you waiting for? Jump in and grab life by the car keys. Discover the Skoda range to find the perfect car for you. From the fully electric Skoda ENIAC, the all-new seven-seater Skoda Kodiak, or their smallest SUV, the Skoda Kamiq. See for yourself. Search Skoda range now. Talking of this second spell, you won so much as a player in it. Let's talk about just how much of a winning machine the club was at that time? Um, yeah, I was fully aware when I ventured into that dressing room for my first game. One who I was sat in amongst, um, which there was a lot of winners already in there. And then two, what was installed within that group and why people were there. Um, yes, you can argue some probably came to experience living in London, but most people came to win trophies. Um, and that is why you signed for this club. Um, yeah. you get the benefit of living in one of the best city in the world of course can't really argue that you come here for the climate <laughs> maybe <you're bringing laughs> yeah. um, but other than that that's why you come to Chelsea um, you get to play for the best club in the world and be part of like you say this this winning juggernaut that is supported by some incredible people incredible fans um, it's a club that is built on 
a blue heart and a blue way of living and like say you sign for this club and you hopefully you sign with a blue pen because you're about to bleed blue for the rest of your time <laughs> um and that's how it is like the the club embraces you the fans embrace you and they will for the rest of your time like even now it's like Carly Chelsea, Chelsea legend whatever and I'm just like I, I don't really know how that happened I, I do in terms of like because I played for this club but it's like yeah. they just embrace you so much because you've brought so much joy to so many people um and that's what this club is it's 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 it brings people look forward every weekend and I guess you can argue weeknights at the minute the amount of games of girls and, and the lads have got mm. it's just that people look forward to watching you guys play and, and walk out on that pitch and representing this team and um yeah it's just a it's it's just an incredible club to be part of and it's it's you don't realize until you step out of this country how big the club actually is and how global it is and um especially the girls now I think the way women's football has changed and evolved they're they're literally global superstars we went to like say Morocco and and some of the the guys who were working in the hotel were so excited to meet some of the girls and said that they followed them on Instagram and blah and I'm like not why obviously I know why because they're incredible they're incredible team and incredible humans but at the same time you're thinking this is mad because it literally felt like we'd arrived with like a men's team like and okay. they were just superstars because they just they understood them they knew them they knew who they were who they played for like, who their countries were like said that wow. some of them say they picked them on EFAFC to play on FIFA and you're just like this is mental like but it's just part of the of the of the brand um of 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 working for this incredible club um and yes you can argue it's a turbulent time but what club hasn't had its turbulences like this is just yeah. part of our i guess re-identity as a club um, and also and it's the growth happen when of women's sport. The growth sport. of women's sport, the growth yeah. of, the, of the men's game and the men's team transitioning. It's just, but it's also like hugely exciting as to where we can take both parts of the club and as well as the academy and how we make it and take it back to this kind of superpower um, with the women's team who have continued to be successful, but also for the men's team that are, are going through that transition transition period. Um, it's a, a super exciting part. Yeah, I think of, I think with the men's us. team, we've seen it happen um, at Arsenal. We've seen it happen at United. We're seeing it happen with so many different clubs. So mm. it, it's not um, it's not anything new. It's just not ideal when you're the fan base and you're like, I just want to yeah. keep winning all the time. Um, <laughs> Especially when that's all you're used to, right? So yes. like all we're used to is just winning, right? So it's like, how do you then justify that when you're not winning like who are we what is this team yeah. about how do we justify ourselves what do we stand for what is the what is the brand of Chelsea if we're not winning um, this is a fantastic brand that is so central to the heart of London but has this hugely successful global aspect about it as well and it's so culturally like within football itself and the years and years of not just winning that's been kind of built on and it's helping fans understand that bit and really buy into it. And I think that if we can do that now and then build our success again, both men's and women's, it will be, mm. there's something so much so like, to be proud of about this club that we don't really talk about. And I'm hoping that we can do that more. And by doing things like this and letting fans into kind of an insight of who we are as people, as footballers, but also I guess now I'd sit on the other side is yeah. how, how, those things and how we feel as a business, we we can take this where we can take this club is that's the most exciting bit for me. Um, and to still be part of 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 leading this kind of us on this new journey. Um, but yeah, going back to football, um, yeah, being part of the women's team is yeah, it's just an it's just an amazing, amazing group of people to be part of as staff and as a player. Um, and this part of the season, it's the roughest part because yeah. you eat, sleep and breathe it you don't get a break. It's 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 great because we're in every competition, mm -hmm. which is incredible. But you are literally, you can't lose a game. It doesn't exist. Because that usually means you've either lost a trophy or you've lost the league. Um, and that's just how it is. You literally get up, you go to training, you go home, you probably watch Netflix, you chill out, you pack your bag because you've got a game in two days, you're traveling, <laughs> you empty your bag, you come home, you do your laundry, you're in your family, you go to sleep, you go to training. And that's, that's it for the next two months. And then hopefully but compared you're pick, to, picking up trophies. Compared to back then when it was wake up, go to my call centre job. <laughs> and then <laughs> Yeah. It, no, it was. Yeah. It's a, it's a but I, again, like you wouldn't change it for the world. And I, I remember speaking to the guys in the office about it, about this period in the season. Like I think it was it was two weeks and I think Man City were in two semifinals. We were in two semifinals and there was an important game in the middle. 
and City end up losing those two semi-finals. And, and like literally in those two weeks, I remember being sat on the bus and coming back from Man City. And I think we'd lost our draw and we were like, we've lost the league. We had another, we had Champions League midweek and we were like, just need to get through it. And literally in those two weeks, it's like you can be in everything or out of everything. And that that yeah. was it. In like two weeks, your whole season, you've been going since July, end of July. So you've been going for like eight months and in two weeks you were in everything and then out of everything. And that's how like brutal it is. But also that's the most exciting time because if you're still in everything, you're happy days. Yeah. If you're if you were Man City at that time, not to speak about them, but like it was kind of probably like, well, what do we do now? We've just got league to focus on. So yeah, it's a it's brutal, but it's also why you come to this club. So you just well, find touching. You, you drag each other through it. Every yeah, day. I mean, I, it's weird. You can't really imagine that an athlete. You work so much for such a, a short period of time. I guess I, I remember working on the athletics, and I thought that some of these athletes, you've got the world championships, and then you've got the Olympics, and if something happens, or if that particular run or jump or whatever it is goes wrong, it's just so brutal. And yeah. The, and the yeah, I guess and the, that is the sport. Game. It's like f- the fine margins are incredible, um, and we're lucky that we get another go at it like you say like yeah athletics olympics or like that one moment for a medal but then it's even when you look at like the euros or the game on sunday that one moment like if that ball goes in off the post if that yeah. miss hits someone if it takes deflection if it doesn't like just all those little things the way the ball rolls sometimes like yes. it's all about moments and that is what makes elite sport like the purest form to watch and the most exciting thing and it is about marginal moments when you get to the top because every dressing room is stacked with international players. Everyone's doing, Mm. everyone's training, everyone's doing the hard work, but it's those moments in games that sometimes it's the role of the ball, it's the look, it's the whatever, or it's just who was just ready for it more on the day. And you can't put your finger on it. A bit of luck, exactly. (laughs) It's, um, and that's, that's all it is. It's just, but that's why we also play like the most amazing game in the world for me, because it's, it's a season long slog. But I tell you what, when it comes to the end of the season and you're sat with three and four trophies, like it is the best feel in the world. And we all look at each other after we've torn each other new ones every <laughs> month and every week and fought and battled each other and cried and <laughs> held each other in all these times. Because again, like we're people as well. So there's so much happens in the season that nobody knows about. Yeah. No one knows about like the difficulties of, of the girls moving from abroad. And I mean, we did the COVID times and some of the girls didn't get home for like 18 months to see their families mm. and all this other stuff that's going on in the background. You just like see the girls for 90 minutes and and that's what we judge them on. But I'm like all this other stuff. And then it comes to the end of the season and the tears and the laughs and whatever just all becomes worth it when you've got those things that you set out at the beginning of the year to do. You can finally look back and say, it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth well, it. Fran actually talked to us about some of the celebrations after a, a big win and you've touched on that as well. Are there any particular nights that stand out for you after winning a trophy that you that you just think, oh my gosh, that will go with me forever. I'll take that to my grave. <laughs> um, I loved it. There's a, there's a few, to be fair. Uh, I think my first FA Cup was one of my favourite ones. Um, just because I'd, I'd been so close. It was like my third attempt at winning the FA Cup. And I find, and I think it's my favorite one as well because it was it was like the first trophy I got to lift in front of my parents as well. And I actually, I lifted the trophy in May, I think it was May fifth, and then I lost my mum in July. So she actually got to see me lift it before I lost her as well, which was like incredible. Because I guess if you're yeah. a parent and all you've wanted to see your kid is be successful or like follow their dreams or fulfill their dreams, whatever it was, like I guess she finally got me to got to see me do that which was yeah. obviously insane and then I just remember the party after that which was <laughs> very 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 fun um but yeah we, we've had some incredible nights after games um and I guess probably some of my favorite ones were like Champions League nights as well like where we first ever beat Wolfsburg or first ever beat like Bayern Munich who we'd been beat off time after time after time or first qualified into a semi-finals or a quarter-finals for this club like those are the nights I think I'll remember the most because also not to sound brutal, but kind of not many people knew who we were either. So when we went on a okay. night out or we got given the keys to a hotel room to just go and have a good time or Paul decided to put his card behind the bar and we could just have a great night. 
the next morning when we were all hung over and going back, flying back on EasyJet or whatever flights we were put on because we didn't have a game that weekend. Like okay. nobody knew who we were. No one took pictures. No one judged us. We just kind of <laughs> put our shades on, got on our EasyJet flight, went home and were able to just be hung over and no one cared. Whereas now I think the girls have to be a little bit more careful. And also a lot of them yeah. fly home privately straight after the games now and they usually have a game in the next few, three or four days. But I think because we had like... Not that it wasn't as serious, but there wasn't as many games. I think we had more time to kind of have these like miniature blowouts throughout the season where we could really celebrate those trophy wins. Whereas now I feel like the girls probably don't get it until the end of season because of how many national caps they have, camps they yeah. have, how many trophies are on and how many games they play, which is probably so much more now um, than what they ever did. So I think for me, those memories I'll hold on to. And I've still got a lot of videos and photos that maybe one day... Uh, I'll put out into the public um, <laughs> about how much fun we had on the buses and on flights and in hotel rooms. Um, but yeah, it was just, I, th I think I'm very grateful for, for for being able to live in that kind of dual space where it was so important to us because it was such a big game and such a big moment, but also, I guess, media and um, stuff wasn't as intrusive so we could kind of enjoy ourselves a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, I think you are in a special place because you you have seen the before and you have seen the now, which is, it is really, it is just really different. Not many people, you know, most people are coming into what it is now. They're coming into the spotlight. They're coming into being taken photographs off. They're coming into the social media and everything, the complexities that that brings. Um, before, before we move on to your role now, I, and I've loved all your favorite moments. I want to get bit more of an insight on Emma and her her team talks and what she's like on a day to day because I, I I'm guessing that she's just an array of different colors and moods on different days absolutely um and I, th I think the beauty about Emma is that it's a constant evolution with her every every year every preseason there was something different so we always kind of knew that like, we'd come in for preseason and be like, what podcasts has she listened to? What books has she read? Which philosophers has she dove into? And what kind of craziness is she going to bring into preseason? Um, right. One, like I think her ambition to treat us as women was like the biggest eye opener for me. I think forever in a day, we just, as female athletes, we just expected to be like, you don't know what you don't know. So we didn't know any different in terms of how maybe we should be treated as female athletes. So we just kind of went along with whatever we were told. But I think okay. her ambition and drive to treat us as female athletes and not small men was probably my biggest thing that she drove year on year, whether that's bringing in a menstrual doctor, a sleep doctor, like really okay. delving into like sports science and how do we how do we make it different? It's not just about everyone doing S and C the same way. We're all different athletes, different women. We're all yeah. different sizes and playing different positions and need different strengths and have different weaknesses. And it was all about like, so when you get to elite levels, it's all about percentages. And she was constantly and is constantly always trying to find like, how are we different and how do we use your differences to make you better? And not like it's a weakness, it's a, it's a betterment. And um, I just loved that about her and, our staff was probably, I don't know, about six or seven when I first joined Max, including behind the scenes staff. And I think, oh God knows, I think it's about 25 or 30 now. Um, and they all have such intricate roles around the team, whether that's nutrition, sports science, pelvic floor, sleep, menstrual cycle, analysis, um, data collection, all this stuff that is, again, goes on behind the scenes, but it just builds this kind of juggernaut of like professionalism. There's not one stone that's not yeah. turned by her. Like she wants to know everything and how we can get the best out of every single person. And then also, I guess, just treating us as humans. But I do think that's, I think that's so interesting that you said there, um, we didn't know how to be treated as female athletes. And that was the thing that you, you learned from her because it is true. You're, you're, you know, we have cycles every month. We have hormones. We, we, we are different to men. It's just, the way that it is and that needs to be treated in a different way my my job allows me to use my voice but I don't have to be physically at my top every single day and you know there's certain times a month where 
I just want to stay in bed. <laughs> I just want to, you know, it's just because that's what happens. We go through a cycle. It's why it's called a cycle. Yeah. Um, and some so of it's it, so brutal on the players. I remember my roommate at England is, was Laura Bassett, was my teammate at Chelsea for a short period of time as well. But my England roommate for about two or three years. And I remember like at the time we used to, we used to share rooms at England and um, some days I'd, the alarm would go off and I'd be like, Bass, are you all right? And she'd be like, no room you like, you need to tell the doctor, like, I can't, she was just in, she had such a bad migraine, she just couldn't train that day. Mm. So like you think we're on England camp, we've got two qualifiers at the Bass, at the time Bass was a start and centre half, like very, very incredible player. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I can't, can't move. And like, you just like, it just never got like, no one, like not no one spoke about it. A doctor would come in, make sure she's all right, whatever. But just kind of like, you just ex- expectation is to just like crack on, two paracetamol, get on the pitch, <laughs> everything yeah. will be all right. But you don't also know what kind of risks you're putting yourself, the team and your body in by yeah. forcing yourself to do those things either. So yes, there's the physical, but then there's the mental aspects as well. So it's how do we create those spaces where one, the girls feel comfortable enough to talk about them, but also then how do we help? Is that through diet? Is it through nutrition? Is it through medication? Is it through... Like I know Beth England spoke a lot about having to go and look at her endometriosis. There's also more things that you think you're yeah. just dealing with as a female and they're okay to deal with and everybody's dealing with it. But actually like, no, you've actually got something that needs treated. Like, yes. um, so like there's these other things that I think until you delve deeper um, into the athlete themselves and into the human so that they're comfortable enough to talk about it, that it, they, there is something more than just kind of, it's not, it's a normal to have a normal period, but then there's other strands around that then yeah. it's how do you also then help that person feel, be able to come train and turn up as the best athlete every day and best footballer. Um, so yeah, it's, then, then, then moments are huge. And I think that's how she, she operates. She comes up with these mad things like, uh, what was the thing? If it's not broken, break it, which we didn't really understand. I think we've come off the back of winning a double or a treble the season before and come in and was like, if it's not broken, let's break it. And we were like, what does that mean? Completely <laughs> tore up everything we'd done the season before like had this brand new philosophy that we went on tour with, got beat like every single game. I think it was like 4-0 off Bayern, 5-0 off Montpellier and 3 off someone else. And everyone was like, well, it's definitely broken. Good luck for, <laughs> good luck for the rest of the season. And then we went on to win a double again. So it worked. <laughs> um, but yeah, she's just, uh, I think uh, one currently that's in the training ground is what didn't get us here won't get us there. Or didn't get, yeah, something like that. It's like literally on the walls you walk in. And it's just those constant reminders of like, we can't stand still. Like you just can't, yeah. like as a, as a football team, you look at, even if look at the men's, the Peps, the, the Arsenal, like every year, like how do they win? How do they keep winning? How do they, even though they're really good teams, like they have to adapt because every team goes away and looks at them and thinks, how do we beat this team? What yeah. are they doing different? How do we stagnate them? Who beat them last year? What did they do? Did they sit in a low block, mid block? Did we counter attack on them? Is it set pieces their weaknesses? So we're having to constantly evolve so that when we come to the season year after, there is something different about us or we can adapt to the next game. The next time we play Arsenal, the next time we play City, whatever it is, there's a, there's a small adaptation, whether it's a personnel change or a tactical change. See, so Shulk has played in multiple positions. How do you handle that as an opposition, as a manager? Like, what do you do? So I think she's just very clever at doing those things and, and never wanting to sit still. Um, I think I'm going to miss seeing that. Uh, yeah. next year but I guess you get to see that in a, a different way in terms of what she's about to do with the US national team but um, yeah I think I'll miss miss that I'll miss her sitting in where I'm sitting now in these press conferences um, yeah I think everyone will in her personality and what she brings how she's challenged numerous parts of the game from the referees to the stadiums to the pitches uh, to the way we treat the players the staff um, how the WSL and the FA are treating teams and players like I think she's just always challenging the bar and always putting herself in these probably uncomfortable uncompromising positions but knowing that it's hopefully for the greater good of the game um and this team so well it just I think it comes across from everything that you said it's incredibly powerful to have a leader that if especially coming from the two spells that we touched on earlier where you've seen the growth of the game so you probably do start off being like I've got a headache, but it's fine. Or I've got my period and it's fine, whatever. Or I've got endometriosis or whatever it is. And you're like, just ignore it. Keep my head down. Let's keep going. Because you know what? The men don't complain. So we've got to be this certain way. And having a leader that's like, okay, let's bring someone in to analyze our cycles. Let's bring someone in to be a specific part of nutrition. Let's bring someone in to look at this. And so suddenly you're like, actually we're women, so we need to be treated differently. It gives you that voice. It. it do you think it's shaped 
possibly your personality and or maybe not personality but it's shaped certain aspects of your mentality that you've maybe taken into your new role has it transcended you as a player and i think it has everyone I th i'd like to think when they probably leave this club and whatever they're going to next like one i think being part of a team or playing any sport in a team when you leave a team environment and go into like another team, because that's what I always say now, like even though I have an individual title, I still work in a team. So yeah. I'm very passionate about making sure that every member of my team that I work with feels important because that was something that to be successful, I feel like every person, whether it was at England or whether it was at Chelsea, like when we turned around and looked at the end of the season, every person played their part. It doesn't didn't okay. matter how big or how small that was. Of course, you've got Sam Coe's the top goal scorer and the goalkeeper maybe keep the clean sheets and the captain or whatever. Did you? But then there was all those people that played those roles, whether they were subs, they were the people that grinded every day so the subs, so the first teamers could get rest, the, the let, let start eleven could get rested and whatever. All those like intricate bits, but. I think that, yeah, like taking some of what shaped me as, I guess, an amateur to semi-pro to professional footballer and all those experiences around that and the people that were part of my journey and part of my life. And Emma was such a part, big part of that. And don't get me wrong, like it's not that Emma doesn't hasn't made mistakes or, or bad decisions or whatever. I'm sure she'll, she can elaborate on those things as well eventually, or like, should I have done this better? Or could I have said that better? Like she's not perfect person, but there's so many good things about her and her being our manager for such a long period of time, not just her trophies, but how she's developed us all personally, challenged us, picked us up. Like I say, when I lost my mom, God, she was incredible for me like and she has been for so many of us that have either lost someone or gone through a tough time or had to battle through things whether it's injury or personal issues like she's been there for us as and you forget as well like when you become a football and you move away from your family like this this team becomes your family your staff yeah. members become like your mom's your big sister your dad's your cousins your uncles however you want to treat them because you lean in on them like Stuart was a huge part of my career my goalkeeping coach like he had to unfortunately four of us women he has to deal with on a daily basis and all of our own personal stuff that comes with that. But he treats us all with such dignity and such passion that I think that you always want to give your best for him. And I think that's with Emma is like, no matter what was going on when you cross that white line, like you just want to fight for the badge and fight for her. Because you know, somewhere yeah. along the line, she's she's had to do that for you. Um, so yeah, I think that she has probably had a huge effect on, on me as a person. Um, I think this club has, I think the people that I've worked with day in, day out, as players have as well. Um, like I said, I was in early in the podcast, like I'm just so lucky to have come across so many people, so, so many intelligent people and had some really amazing conversations about different things in life, um, different cultures, different ways of living, different ways of, of in, like integrating within different groups of people and understanding and um, having to understand being a starter, being a sub, being left out of a squad, like it just builds you into who you are now, I guess. So yeah, I think she's played a massive role in, in my life personally. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very blessed to have had, I guess, a leader and I'd say probably now more a friend. So yeah. Oh, I love that. I feel like you need <laughs> Emma in my life. Bit. <laughs> I know, but it's good. I mean, why wouldn't you go deep? Let's <clears> talk <throat> about your new role now. For anyone who doesn't know, what is your new role? And can you tell us a little bit more about what it entails on a daily basis? Yeah, of course. Um, I think the fans think I'm in charge of everything, which is very beautiful and all goes really well. <laughs> and everyone thanks me on Twitter. <laughs> but I am actually a small part of a, of, a, of, a, of a smaller team, I'd say. We're not a huge team, um, but I my official title is um, commercial manager, uh, women's commercial manager. But I sit across not just the women's team, I sit across some of the men's stuff as well, because obviously when we bring in new partners and brands are not always just the women's only ones. So we sit across mm -hmm. joint things. Um, but my job effectively is to, I mean, if you want to put it bluntly, I'm a salesperson, which is kind of boring. <laughs> so I like the title better. Um, but my job is to sell this club and sell this amazing team to amazing brands and partners to come in and invest and keep um, us being able to be the best. And that's whether we invest it back into the facilities, back into the players, mm. uh, back into our academies. Um, that's eff effectively what my job is. But I think Basically, our director, Zara al um, and Nadia, uh, she is our head of hospitality and ticketing. That's kind of the three-person 
women's team. <laughs> it's three of us. Um, but we have slowly dragged multiple people from different departments who sit across the whole club from marketing to socials to comms um, into a wider team that now looks after what we hope to be. And my personal um, goal is to make this the best commercial team in the world um, and the most successful. Uh, and that's mine and Zara's kind of and Nadia's um, big ambition. Um, and we know that's going to take time. Uh, we know we are a little bit behind the curve in this country and um, Barcelona in terms of commercial terms and ticketing and just behind Arsenal. But we are doing good things. It's just going to take time and we just need the fans to be a little bit patient with us, but we are loving their enthusiasm. Um, we love that we're being challenged. We love mm. that they have questions. We love that we want them to be involved in this journey. We know without the fans, the club is nothing. It is, that is what the foundation of any successful team is built on. Um, and now it's just about understanding how we take them on this journey with us. Um, so as much as we bring in these amazing partners, how do we get them invested in it, get them part of it, get them to feel that we are constantly investing back into the team with amazing players, with good staff, with amazing experiences when they come to the ground. Um, and that I think we demonstrated, we knew we were going to build this year, hopefully to the Arsenal game, which was our last official league game at Sanford Bridge. And we wanted that to be a really big kind of show of what it's taken us eight months to do. But eight months is, we're about 18 months behind Arsenal in what they're doing. So if this is the start of where we're going, I think it's a good sign. And we're hoping that Barcelona will demonstrate, hopefully we can get a sellout for that. Um, will be really, really, really key for us. I think we're leading women's only commercial partners in the league. So we're doing good on that front. But yeah, we yeah. just want to constantly demonstrate to fans that we understand, we hear them, tick it in, um, all that kind of stuff where we are reassessing as well. Um, so it's not like we don't hear those conversations. We've made sure we've had numerous forums with the fans, some of the, the major groups that have been with us um, since the beginning, my time, way back when. Yeah. Um, and having constant contact with them as to how they feel, how are the group feeling, how are the fan base is feeling, how do we get more people to the games, how do we make it the best experience, how do we make them feel valued um, for the, giving us their time, their money, their effort to get to games. Um, but it does take time. You can't just pull... 4,000 people from King's Meadow and turn it into 40,000 people at Stamford Bridge overnight. Yeah. We know we've got a legacy to build and, uh, um, and yeah, it's, it's getting there and quietly confident that, um, hopefully this time next year, we will be filling Stamford Bridge regularly. Um, and yeah, it's, it's more hard work than what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah. I think I thought, I think it's quite naive as a player and I've had to go in and unfortunately have numerous conversations with the players because the players ask the same question. Why are yeah. Arsenal selling out? Why aren't we doing it? We're, we're the most successful team. We've won the most trophies. Like, why can't we? And I'm like, guys, I'm with you because I was asking the same questions like when I was sat next to you. But yeah. it isn't, it honestly isn't as easy as that. And that's not a cop out. That's just like, it's a, it's building a brand. It's building a team internally yeah. that can talk about those things to the, the people that sell the club and brand the club and all that kind of stuff. It's just, there's a multitude of, of things we need to build on to make it happen. And I've sat in with Arsenal who, who have been building this for a lot longer than we have. And it's understanding how they position themselves, how they did it. And, and this is another thing I think is that we want to make the sport successful. It's not about yeah. Arsenal setting records constantly week after week. It's about how do we make sure everyone is filling their stadiums? Everyone yeah. is coming on this journey that women's football is just, we're not speaking about the crowds anymore because it's just normal. Like we're filling stadiums. That's, that's how it should be. Like it's, people should want to come and watch these amazing athletes, these amazing women represent an amazing brand. Um, and they're fierce, they're feisty, um, they're, <laughs> athletic they're creative they're they're just they're a joy to watch and it's a it's a joy to be part of and we just want people to understand that and and fill the stadiums and make noise for them and keep elevating the game to where it should be and i have no doubt that our fan base will do that um from all over the world we get support um and just we've got to create that now in the uk in london and make people want to come to the stadium have a great time but also support like they did against arsenal which was and I don't know if any of the girls have said it, but after that game, I got so many messages from the players being like, car, that was the most amazing atmosphere. We like, 
it is the percentages that gets them over the line, those difficult moments when Arsenal were starting to crank the pressure up mm. and the noise from the Arsenal way was getting a bit loud. Our fans were straight on top of them and their noise just elevated and it made the girls dig a bit deeper, made them do that extra. And it, it does make such a big difference to you on the pitch. Um, and it's it's like, I almost wanted the girls to be like, tell tell the fans yourself because <laughs> I'm like they, they I want you them like and, and they have done they have been putting out like we know how important the fans are to to making a difference to the team um, yeah. and yeah it's important for us to make sure we, we are getting fans in and, and, and giving them them extra like say those small percentages that make a difference and filling that stadium is one of them and I'd like to think that Barcelona is coming up in the next few weeks and not only are you going to get to see two of the best teams in the world go with each other um, with incredible, incredible athletes but, and footballers, but you're hopefully going to be in one of the best atmospheres um, yeah. this season will have had when you come to Stamford Bridge. And I'm going to make sure that um, whatever we have going on that day, it will be um, hopefully a highlight of the year, not just for our club, but hopefully all over the world to see. Well, because you've seen the growth of the sport on and off the field, and you, we've talked about this kind of the two parallel universes that you've um, you've lived in. How do you think your view of the game has differed from your current role and being a player? And I, and I guess is there a part of you that wishes you'd spent more of your career playing in this growth phase of the women's game? Although we did talk about the pros that you can get an easy jet flight <laughs> after celebrating no, all night. <laughs> yeah, no, I I did. I, I've been asked this a lot, like especially when like at the Arsenal game or uh, when we've met brands and partners, they're like, do you not, do you not wish you were still playing in this? Like whether it was the Tottenham or Man United game, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I honestly don't. And that's not just me saying it because I can say it. It's me being honest. Like I loved my career. Like I had the best time with some of the best memories. And I just don't know if I would enjoyed it as much as I did if I was living in it now. I think it's okay. it's very difficult to, to not do both, but yeah, to have a life of, I'm not a normal person. That's the wrong thing to say. A non-athlete or a non... But, I mean, not a celebrity. I think that's, that, that, I yeah. think that's the thing. The girls' the lives have changed. They're not, yeah, they're not footballers, just footballers anymore. Yeah. Sorry, they're celebrities and footballers. So that's a lot more to carry than just going and playing football and then going home and going yeah. to the local pub or going to see your mates or going to the supermarket. Not to say the girls don't do that, but it's actually quite difficult to just yeah. do and not be judged as to who you're with or where you're eating or how many drinks Absolutely. you're having and what's in the coke. Is it is it is it just coke or is it coke and vodka or whatever you're having? Yeah. How many nights is that before kickoff or all that kind of stuff that I'm like, I couldn't, I don't think I could do that very well. Um, like I say, I do enjoy my life and I got to live kind of parallel and sit between the two. Um, but that's not to... To the, and the girls have amazing lives they do but I just I think that I couldn't exist in that in that space so I'm very grateful that I get to sit outside of that and help the girls navigate that now but to see the yeah. growth and like just to see the people with like the girls names on their shirts and like and we're not just talking about like young girls and women we're talking about like men and boys and girls and women and LGBTQ and just these this huge diverse fan base that we've now got which is incredible. Like, and I'm just so grateful that we've been able to create this kind of amazing safe space for so many different people to come and enjoy, which again, I'll say it again, the best sport in the world. <laughs> um, and I think that's what I'm so proud of when I stand up in one of the boxes, if I'm hosting and working, I just look around at, at the diverse group of people that are around and how much fun they're having and how much joy that they're getting out of coming and watching um, Chelsea or whoever we're playing or, or both teams um, and it's it's just you see them when we win and and or even when we lose the conversations they're having and the players that they're passionate about and they're talking about tactics or how much fun they had or what we can do better and I'm like that is incredible like it's not just people who know these girls they have they follow them because they just think they're incredible athletes and it's an incredible team and yeah. I guess as as footballers that's all we've wanted we've never wanted to be classed as female footballers. We've just wanted to be classed as footballers. Like that's all we do. We just turn up, put our boots on our kit, represent an amazing club and go and do what we've done. And I know the Linus had such an impact on that for the first time ever. I felt yeah. like gender wasn't a thing. It was just, are you going to watch the England game? Are you going to watch them play against Sweden? Are you going to watch the final? No one spoke about, are you going to watch the women's football? Are you going to watch England women play tomorrow? It was just like, 
are you going to watch the England? Are you going to watch England play? And like, that is yeah. all we've ever wanted. Like if you just remove gender from it, like it's 11 players, including the subs and staff, who are just passionate about winning a game of football for this club or for this country. And I think that's what, there's been a huge change in the past few years. And I think the Lioness has really helped with that, but it's taken time and there are some people out there who still don't agree with it um, and they will get left behind, which is unfortunate for them. But the ones that are coming on the journey will enjoy themselves very much, I feel like. Oh, Carly, I mean, I could chat to you all night. I think I've still got <laughs> about 50 questions that I haven't got through that I would love to know. So I'll have to get you back on because I know that you are a busy woman with your sales and your deals <laughs> and all the partnerships coming out your ears. Oh, thank you so much for joining us on We Are Chelsea. We've absolutely loved it. Thank it's you. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to We Are Chelsea, the official podcast of Chelsea Women brought to you in association with Skoda, the official car partner of Chelsea Women and proud supporters of women's sport. During the course of this series, we'll be speaking in depth to more of Chelsea's top players and we'll also be bringing you all the post-match reaction to the biggest games with the players themselves. So remember to subscribe, give us a review and send in your questions to wearechelsea at chelseafc.com. See you next time.